Good morning. This is Steve Stites, the Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System, broadcasting live with you from the Dahl Simons Family Studio. Delighted to be back with you on this warm spring day. Wait a minute. No, no, no. It's December, but it's going to be 60 degrees. It does not feel like the holiday yeah. season. Kind of a funny deal, but we're, we're delighted that it's that warm. We think it's probably helping us out there still. Joining me in the studio today is Dr. Chris Brown, one of our outstanding hospitals. He has been with us before on this program. We welcome him back to our program. Um, he has been treating COVID-19 patients since day one, and he got the COVID-19 vaccine on Friday. We're going to ask him a little bit about his decision to do that and how we think that's going to affect his life. And, of course, we're always joined by mm. Dana Hawkinson, uh, Doc Hawk, our medical director of infection prevention and control. Hawkeye, how do we do overnight? Um, you know, we're continuing to be a lot better than we thought we would. Still not the best, but um, the numbers are much lower than, than we had been having and much lower than we thought we would have. Uh, 76 acute infections in the hospital, 28 of those in the ICU, so not a high proportion, but a high proportion of those in the ICU are on the ventilator, 20 patients out of 28 uh, in the ICU are on the ventilator. We still have some uh, in that recovery period, 65 total in the recovery period, and 10 of those remain on the ventilator as well. So That's once tough. you get on the ventilator, it takes some time to get off. Um, the numbers in Hayes, uh, about steady as well, 27 uh, infections. Uh, 18 of those are active and, and nine in that recovery period. So that, that's good for them too, you know, um, just with the smaller resources, their numbers were fairly high, kind of coming down as well. And that's always a good thing. Okay. Well, we have a picture that uh, we're showing here of Chris Brown, who is getting his vaccine last Friday. We're going to come back to that discussion in a moment. My chair just moved down. I just shrank six feet. That's great. <laughs> so let's first go. <laughs> I'll fix that. Just one moment. I'll fix. You know, that's, a, that's an interesting feeling as the world sinks below you. <laughs> uh, let, let's first go to reporter questions out there. Well, I fixed my chair. Hi, Dr. Sites, I do have a couple of questions from Ariel uh, with uh, oh, hey, hang, on, hang on, we got, we got one. Go okay. ahead. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Oh. yeah. Um, okay, sorry. This is Ellen McNamara from KCTV5. Um, so I have a quick question, and I don't know anything about this, but I think Dr. Dana Hawkinson probably does. Um, what is PEG uh, that, you know, is now some people we're learning about is in the Pfizer and now the Moderna vaccine? Um, maybe it's causing these allergic reactions, who knows, but can you just, uh, Hawk, can you just kind of describe, you know, what this is for the person who has no idea, um, you know, who's sitting at home, what this thing is? You know, that's a fascinating question, Hawk, yeah. because, you know, um, as you know, I, I do CF care, and we use a ton of polyethylene glycol yeah. at CF. Yeah. <laughs> and so we use it for constipation. I and, think, uh, that's I think our colleague like, over here, used, he would probably know and use it more than we, I even do. Yeah, but. we use quite a lot for go like the prep and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's we use you, it a lot. Mm -hmm. So when you have to go get your colonoscopy, or if you're a CF patient and you have to deal <laughs> with routine constipation, you take, care, you take polyethylene glycol all the time. It's also known Correct. as Miralax. Yeah, it's also known as Go Lightly, yes, yeah. one of the greatest misnomers in the history of the world. Yes. Go Lightly. No. That's the drug that makes you It's not light to a lot it's of people. It's not light at all. You. Go a lot. Go a lot. <laughs> yeah. Go a lot. But Hawkeye, why is it in a vaccine? Yeah, you know, um, I'm not sure really the reason uh, it's in the vaccine. A lot of these products that we see or these other molecules in the vaccine are really to stabilize uh, the vaccine, the payload and all that. Um, it could be a stabilizing um, uh, a particle within in the vaccine itself. We know there are no preservatives in the in the vaccine. We know the the PEG or the polyethylene glycol is a common um, substance as we've talked about. It's used every day in the hospital. Um, why would it be using this? It must be some for some sort of stabilization of that nanoparticle. Um, is kind of the only thing I can think of. But you think people, I mean, you can react to just about anything. We're seeing yeah. these beautiful Christmas decorations. One of us could react to this poinsettia. Yeah. One of us could react to that Christmas ornament there. And, it, and, and, and I think when you give it, for example, I, I, again, I've given it thousands of times. Yeah. I'm sure you've given it, Chris, thousands of times. I've never seen what I would have considered an allergic reaction. Mm -hmm. But when you give it orally, you don't absorb it. Yeah. So I think when you give it IM, it may, be, it may cause an allergic reaction. Again, you have to remember, these allergic reaction, reactions are exceptionally yeah. uncommon. Yeah. 
and we, we should note too, there, uh, you know, PEG or whatever is used in other substances that are injected as well. So this is not a new concept either. I know that there are, the FDA is launching investigations into this, um, looking at the, the vaccine, looking at the specific substances, and they're looking at the people that have reacted. Um, the, the earliest thing that has come about right now certainly is the polyethylene guy called the PEG, uh, but investigations are ongoing. Uh, so hopefully we'll get more information about that. Is there a causal relationship there, meaning does the PEG actually cause that immune reaction that we're seeing, or is it just associated in something else as the cause? So we're really doing the investigations now. But again, this is not a new substance. Uh, substance. This has been used um, every day in the hospital, every day in life. Uh, we know that it also has been formulated with other injectable drugs as well. So. We'll just have to wait and see. Yeah, so we don't really know, but we do know that overall vaccines are incredibly safe. And so we've given that vaccine a lot. And, and Chris Brown, you had it. Did you have a reaction to it? No, sir. How did, no, sir. did you feel, how'd you feel after you had it? I feel fine. And I mean, I've talked to a couple of my colleagues who have also had the vaccine and they feel fine as well. I think when I look at vaccines, um, you know, the process that I underwent that we're using here, I mean, we use that with every vaccine. When I took my children to get their vaccine, yeah. it's the same process. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think, like you said, real bad reactions when it comes to vaccines are super, super, super uncommon. And I had no issues. Okay. Other questions? <clears throat> this is Jody Bertino with KCUR. And I know hey, you Jody. talked. Yeah. I said good morning. <laughs> good morning. So I know you talked about the new COVID-19 vaccine yesterday, and as of this morning, Fauci said it's possible it could already be present in the U.S. So to what degree should people be concerned about the strain, and what kind of impact could it have on where we are in the pandemic if it is present in the U.S.? You know, we do hear lots of updates about yeah. this new strain, mm -hmm. this, this mutant strain of, of SARS-CoV-2. Not surprising, the viruses mutate. They do that all the time. Yeah. So we, this sounds so uncommon. It's not uncommon. It's actually expected. Um, the second thing is that, um, as, as I read it, um, it's not even clear that it, it may be more transmissible or it may just be that it got into a group of yeah. people and that's the one they're, they're, put, they're, they're transmitting to others now. Um, but mutating viruses are common. Influenza mutates all the time. Mm -hmm. So coronaviruses actually mutate less than influenza does. Yeah, yeah, certainly. And I think, you know, because COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 is under the microscope so much, that we are looking at all these changes. We are looking at therapeutics and vaccines under the microscope. We are looking at new isolates and variants because we have the technology to rapidly assess what the genome looks like down to the base pair level of the genome. So we're able to do this. And we see that some predominant forms, and we have seen this since the beginning of the pandemic where you had the original Wuhan strain, then you had the D614G amino acid substitution isolate, which became more predominant around the world. Uh, you know, if Dr. Fauci had talked about if um, that new variant is here in the U.S., it is very likely. Uh, but how much of that, just as you said, is due to behavior? Because we know so much of the spread and this disease process <clears throat> is due to behaviors as much as everything else. So is it because of uh, the behaviors and and not super spreading events, but more um, high spreading events that have led to this. It's unclear. So far, what we, what we believe is that it doesn't have an effect on disease severity, making it more or less severe. Is it more transmissible? That is the early thought. And will it be able to evade the immunity pr provided by our vaccines? We don't believe so. There's no in indication or signal of that yet but we are continuing to investigate. The U UK, the United Kingdom is continuing to investigate, and I'm sure um, NIH, CDC, and everybody here in the United States will be looking for that as well. Yeah, and I think um, what we're seeing so far is that, it, is that it, because it hasn't really changed the fundamental properties of the spike protein, that yeah. the vaccine will still work. Yeah. Um, it doesn't appear to be have worse outcomes than mm -hmm. the original or the, the SARS-CoV-2 we're all familiar with. And what I think our listening public needs to remember is that um, viral mutations happen commonly. Mm -hmm. You feel like this is uncommon and scary because we're all concerned. We've been talking for almost a year now about, or probably over a year really, about SARS-CoV-2. We've been talking about how bad it is. And then every time you hear about it muting again, it, it, it sounds like another wave of fear throughout the population. Viruses mutate constantly. That's actually how they survive. That's how they continue to infect people. Our bodies are built to handle that. And, and I think the vaccine will continue to work. If the spike protein 
could easily mutate, I say easily, I'm not a, a, viral, a virologist, but could mutate even to the point that it no longer is able to get into cells. I mean, there are all mm -hmm. sorts of things that can happen yeah. to these mutations that makes a virus more lethal or less lethal. But it's so far, the one I'm reading about in England, and I tried to read again this morning about it, I didn't find anything that really suggested it's more lethal. Right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> There's no indication of that right now. We know that with that other uh, isolate that became more predominant, the D614G, that caused the spike protein to be in the open con uh, conformation more, meaning more readily um, being able to bind to our receptors. That may have increased its transmissibility and infectiousness. We don't know um, all of the details about these mutations. And again, it's not just one mutation. I believe there were about 30 or so clusters of mutations in this new variant, in this new isolate that they've identified. We know that with that D614G that it was usually associated with several other mutations as well. So this is nothing new. You know, we also remember things like um, you know, antivirals or antibiotics for bacteria. Those seem to have pressure on, on the bacteria so that when you are treating all of the susceptible bacteria, if one develops a resistance, that population then grows. Right now, there's no pressure on this virus to mutate. It's doing it on its own. That's part of the replication process. Um, it is very prone to mutations when it replicates. Uh, but right now, there's no pressure. Yes, we have vaccines, but the amount um, and percentage of people that have been vaccinated is extremely minimal. So there's not any other external pressure on this virus to mutate or become uh, a different type of, of isolate causing more severe disease. Yeah. Other questions? Did you have any? Yeah, this is Ellen again for a follow-up, if you guys you um, sure. can take another follow-up here. Um, yeah. Okay, so obviously you're getting the Pfizer vaccine. Um, are you also expecting the Moderna vaccine? And how much time do you have, like, to prepare for it? Do they just call you and say, you know, the state says, hey, we'll be there in an hour or, you know, we'll be there in 30 minutes? Or is there any kind of... Um, you know, time ahead of time. And then my other question is, okay, let's say grandma just got the shot. She's 80. Um, but, you know, the kids who are maybe, you know, 40, 45, didn't get the shot yet. Can people go see grandma because she got the shot? Maybe they didn't. Or is this still, yeah. we still got to be, we still have to be very careful. All right, let's talk the patient care part first, and then we'll come back to the logistics question. So, yes. Hawk um, and, and, and Chris, yeah. my thought is that grandma got the first shot, grandma's not protected yet. Got to get two shots. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, it, and so that goes to what we've been talking about. Um, I don't have a lot of, of pressure to need to get the vaccine. I think there are other people that work in our health system that have needed and need the vaccine sooner than I do because they are more working with COVID patients every day. Yes, I have a few, but I do feel safe in my, my mask and my goggles. You are definitely more on the front line seeing more COVID patients, your hospital colleagues as well. So once we're able to get that, we will get that. But I also understand that even when I get it, the main point of this is it's not gonna change my practice. I'm gonna continue to wear my mask, physically distance, not meet in large gatherings, do all those things. So even getting that first shot, you need to continue to do those things that we have been talking about for the last 10 months. So important. And, and I think that grandma is not yet protected yeah. because she needs to have both shots. And even if she were to have both shots, is she more protected? Can others go to see her? And the answer, she is more protected, right? That's why we're giving the vaccination. That's a good thing. But remember that those who haven't been um, had the shot yet, if they're coming from different bubbles, they can still go ahead and exchange mm -hmm. the virus. Yeah. So we just want to be really careful with that. The other point is that if not everybody around grandma has been uh, unprotected, you may still, the, the, the vaccine prevents you from getting critically ill. That's, that was clear in both Moderna yeah. and Pfizer yeah. data. We don't know that it prevents you from transmitting the virus. So if you still get the virus, you might well be able to give it to someone else. That jury is still out. We think it may offer some protection, but we don't know that for sure. And as a result, you give grandma the virus, she'll, she can still get the virus. She just won't get as sick. But she may still transmit that virus to other members. So you just got to be really thoughtful around it. So getting a vaccine, I think it clearly lowers the risks. It makes grandma more accessible, safer to go visit. But just be thoughtful about that. And um, at least for now, until we have better indications of how well we're controlling the spread of the virus post-vaccination, as Hawk said, 
You got to play both offense. You got to play defense. Mm -hmm. You got Patrick Mahomes. That's the vaccination. You got your mask. <laughs> you got the rest of the good things we do. That's Tyron Matthew. We got to have. We got to have both offense and defense. Now let's go back to the logistics question. So, yeah. you know, logistics vary from site to site. Some people know earlier because they were a, a storage site, and then once you you kind of got a date for when you were going to have the storage. So you you may have had a little bit more warning. Other folks may have had very little warning. They may have not thought they were going to get no vac no um, vaccine, but then the next day they got a call and say, "Hey, vaccine is here." Hopefully, everybody has been working on their plan for distribution of the vaccine. You know, part of the problem is that um, we all didn't know when the, FDA, the initial EUA was going to be cleared. So you couldn't really know too much in advance yeah. when you were going to get the, 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 the vaccine. Then Pfizer's got, and then, it, then it got distributed, and then um, now Moderna's being distributed. There are general guidelines from the government to go to the states, and the states actually d d decide on the, the key distribution. And then actually the county health departments can also decide their priority for distribution. And the hospital, for example, we decided on our priority. Some hospitals have said we're going to vaccinate those who are 65 or those who are 75 first who are still working in our hospital. We said we're going to distribute it based on intensity and duration of exposure to the virus. So the more likely you are to come in contact with it for a meaningful period of time, the more likely are we want to vaccinate you, whether you're an environmental services worker, dietitian, respiratory therapy, nursing, or physicians. So um, I think that's kind of how we've approached it. Everybody's approached it a little differently, and that is the local control that people have that help meet their needs. And then we heard yesterday, of course, from Jessica Calendar Rich about the plan for distribution within nursing homes. So I think most people have been putting plans in place. I think the real question is how many doses of vaccine are you going to get? And we don't know that yet. And, and, and partly we don't know, you know, Pfizer estimates have varied a little bit. Mm -hmm. Moderna, their estimates have still kind of gone up and down a little bit. So until we know exactly how many how many vaccines we're going to get, and we may not know that for a while, then uh, it's a little harder to map your exact strategy and give people an exact date of when you're going to get vaccinated. So we open it up to a group of people at a time and encourage them all to go get vaccinated. When that one, then we move down to the next group, and that's been kind of our, our order. And I think we've got a good prioritization system, and we don't really differentiate based on age or comorbid disease at this point because we're just trying to get our frontline healthcare workers all vaccinated. And we, we do stay in contact with the state and they have been um, good about letting us know when they expect to have it in. So again, it's coming from the state and then distributed from there. But uh, we've been in contact with them. There was a meeting yesterday. Um, I had another commitment I wasn't a part of, but that's what we had before the Pfizer vaccine. We were able to get that information. So as soon as they get it, they, they really do um, uh, distribute it down to to everybody else on when to expect in the time frame. Well, I just remind everybody, for our listeners, that I think the state of Kansas got, I mean, 20, I want to say, I can't remember if it was 20, uh, 23,000, 23, 24,000 doses. I've got the exact number. We can get that. Um, doses of vaccine. Now, there are a lot more healthcare workers in Kansas. You know, we have, we have 13,500 healthcare workers at KU. Well, guess what? You know, there's only 23,000 doses for the entire state, and you've got all these health care workers across the state. So we, there's just not enough vaccine yet. And I think that's the pressure we feel. I'm very hopeful that in three, four, or five months down the road, we're going to feel a lot differently because we're going to have a lot of different types of vaccine because I think that hopefully we'll have the AstraZeneca and J&J &J vaccine out. We'll have much more of the Moderna vaccine, more of the Pfizer vaccine, and then we'll be in a much better position than we are today. Other questions? So Ariel yes. from KSHB has two questions. The first one is directed initially towards Dr. Brown. What can you say to reassure people who are concerned or skeptical about the safety of the vaccine? Uh, from a reassuring standpoint, I mean, I personally didn't have any issues. Uh, my colleagues um, or my, well, my closer colleagues who I've talked to have had it. They have not had any issues. Um, as Dr. Stice has said, I mean, you know, adverse reactions are very, very, very uncommon. Um, the process that I went through to get this vaccine is no different than any process that I would take my children to, our parents, any vaccine. Um, I think, and to piggyback on Dana, I think that this, we are on such a, it's just a microscope. Everything that goes on with this virus, it is publicized, right or wrong, incorrect or accurate. And I think that, um, you know, with the exception of being warp speed, I think we've gone through everything possible to make sure that this is as efficacious and, um, you know, uh, safe as possible. And I think um, it's very uncommon for 
uh, side effects or extreme adverse reactions that lead to hospitalizations. I think for me and my colleagues, we would probably say that we would probably more likely see somebody have an anaphylactic reaction or some sort of adverse reaction with a antibiotic than we would with Absolutely. a vaccine. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, if there's ever a vaccine that somebody's going to get, because we do know that there are a lot of anti-vaxxers out there, this is the one. I think mm-hmm. I have my own myopic views, right or wrong, you, you, but I mean, uh, I'm ready. but I my mean, turn. this is not something that where my, my myopia can, you know, because it affects everybody. I mean, yeah. I'm really trying to get back to a Christmas where I can see my parents, where we can have yeah. those wonderful gatherings. And I think that's what people need to understand about this vaccine and where we are and with this, what SARS-CoV-2 has done to to us as a community. So, Chris, you feel it. like people should feel safe, whether you're in whatever community you're in. And, and I'm specifically speaking, uh, we uh, <coughs> communities of colors have had a long history of experimentation, yes, and that's, yep. that's a bad and ugly history, right? Yep. But for this time, I think people should feel safe. Do you feel safe? I do, and I think they should, too. And, I mean, I just want to just say, I mean, um, obviously over the course of uh, – this pandemic, you know, y'all have done a very, very good job in highlighting health disparities, taking just taking a show just for those various reasons yep. to talk about those disparities. And, you know, not to prolong this, this this answer, but I mean, it's very deep. It's very deep rooted. It can be very, very emotional. Um, and you, you're right. I mean, there is a long line of just when it comes to African-Americans, minorities, just barriers to health care. Um, the inability to have timely health care, which are two totally different things. Yes. You know, I'm a physician. We're physicians. I love what I do. Um, but, I mean, historically, the Hippocratic Oath has not always mm-hmm. been front line when it comes to, uh, you know, um, research and management with minorities in African-American communities. So when I hear those things from my community and some of my individual friends, we don't want to be guinea pigs. I mean, I understand. They're thinking about Tuskegee experiment. They're thinking about those things. Mm-hmm. But I think that's not where we are now. I think we've made, we, we've done a lot from a public health standpoint. We continue to do a lot um, to break those barriers, to build new bridges, to mend fences. And I think, again, I mean, if there's ever a time to take the vaccine, you just need to get the vaccine. I mean, that's just, that's just bottom line. Yeah, and I just want to say a special shout out, and that was a powerful statement. Thank you. But, you know, I, I know from our health system perspective, and, and I will just say we work so closely with Wyandotte County, with Mayor Alvey, and the health department with uh, Dr. Corvo, Griner, and others. I, I mean, people, are, we're really trying to do this right and to reach into every community with vibrant health and the work they do in, 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 in the community here in Wyandotte. And, and I just have to say, I think people have worked really hard to make sure that we reach every community to offer them the vaccine, to offer them the story about it um, in whatever language, in whatever form. And so hats off to the, the folks who have led Wyandotte County. And I, and I think the same thing's true in Jackson County and, and all our metro, our core four area. So I, I, I feel really good about that. You know. I'm like you. I, there's not been a day that I didn't wake up and think, I am blessed to be a doc. Yeah. And I'm blessed to be able to walk into the University of Kansas and, and the medical center and health system and be a part of that story. And, and I'll tell you, I think part of our story is to help us do things right and, to, and treat people right and to treat people fairly. And we are, we are, you know, we are, we're dedicated to that and, and trying to make sure we get this out for everybody and get the information out for everybody that's in true. every language. And, every language, and it needs to be the facts. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> right. And, and you, know, you, just, you just have to do the right thing. And um, one of our, our, our dedications on this show is to not be flapjackers. Mm-hmm. You know, flap your arms and jack with the truth. Mm-hmm. I, I hate flapjacking. <laughs> and, and I think what we've tried to do is just be in a calm and measured and sometimes funny way to try and tell the story about yeah. what's really going on with coronavirus, not what you read on the darn internet, yeah. what's really going on with right. it to the best of our ability. And Part of that story is recognizing the disparity in health care that's been true for uh, minorities and, and for uh, people of color in the United States, right down to experimentation. And, but what I can say in this case is that is not true with yeah. this virus at this time, at this moment, with this vaccine program. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're doing our very best around that. I think that the only thing that's that different than, than this vaccine and everything else is the warp speed. Yeah, the warp speed, that's <laughs> it, it, right. It, it was moved. It was, it's, it's definitely going through the process a lot faster, but it's safe. That's all right. It's Live safe. long and prosper. Yeah. Love warp speed. Yeah. yeah. It, other thoughts, Hawk? No. All right. Well said, both of you. Ariel has another question, and it kind of goes along with what you all just kind of dove into. But do you think state and local vaccine awareness campaigns can help encourage the general population to get the vaccine once it's available to them? What do you think? I think it can help. Yeah. 
Yeah. I think the best thing that helps is personal testimonial. Yeah. I think your being on this program will do 20,000 times more than another commercial about it. Because what we're really doing is, is people say, I got that vaccine and I'm safe. Then pretty soon people are going to say, yeah, I got the vaccine and I'm, I was okay. Yeah. And the truth yeah. is, it is a lot like getting an influenza shot. Very you, much you, so. you know, mm-hmm. And the second, you know, when you get the booster shot, you may have a few more side effects. But, you know, it's not bad. No. It's just, it's okay, not. I got a few side effects, but I'm, I'm going to be fine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I agree. I, yeah, I think personal testimony means more than anything, whether it's somebody in your neighborhood that you trust, um, a pastor, your, your personal physician that you trust, friends, family, other people that you trust who have got it and, and show you that it's safe. Yeah. And I'll just say, you know, I, I'm not first in line. I think uh, mm-hmm. that, that Chris definitely should yeah. be. He's a frontline guy. He's out there. He's taking care of patients with his partners, the hospitalist and the, you know, the intensivist, the anesthesiologist, the surgeons, the nursing staff. Yeah. The, all those folks are doing all the upfront work with that. Absolutely should get the vaccine first. Hawkeye is going to see more COVID than I do. You should get the vaccine before I do. I don't see as much, so I should be one of the last people to get it on this health system. And you know what? That's the way it is. That's how it, that's the same it is. Time. Uh, if, if it's my turn, I'll take it. But it's not my Get turn. I'm not doing yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, but I want to take it. I'm being clear, man. When it is my turn, let's go. Give it to me, brother. I want that shot. But man, we, we all have his biceps on the show. I know. He likes it. Both of you guys like it. I'd show off my biceps, but it would be a pretty short show. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know I you're laughing, laugh at me, Jessica. Right ahead. Next question. Um, no more reporter questions right now. Okay. Do you want some from the public? Yeah, let's go. First of all, let me just say thank you for being on. We had that picture for Chris Brown uh, get that vaccine. But let's, yeah, let's do that. I mean, we're not, we're not letting you go anywhere. Let's go ahead and, and uh, transition into to our, our questions from the public. So my, it'll be my first mispronunciation, I'm sure, of the day. Is it ivermectin? Mm. I, well done. You got it right. Yeah. Thank you. Ivermectin. Okay. That's everybody's most favorite Internet toy here. Let's go ahead. Okay, so several people have um, <clears throat> written in some questions about that. Just can you address it and it being touted as a cure? Okay. Is it a cure? There's no role for ivermectin in treatment or prophylaxis against COVID-19. That's the most simple answer. Longer to show it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we've had this question throughout the last nine months, ivermectin. It comes yeah. up once a week or whatever, and yeah. it's right up there with some of the other things we've heard touted, like vitamin D mm-hmm. or vitamin E or vitamin A or this or that or, or um, you know, Clorox and stuff. And what we know is that that stuff really doesn't work, and some of it's actually harmful right. to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, there, there continues to be new research about it. Um, the latest one I saw, and I forget what the publication was, was that there was no beneficial effect of ivermectin. Most of the time in the doses that you need to take ivermectin for it to be really of benefit um, from the doses they used in those initial benchtop or lab experiments, those doses would be toxic to humans anyway. So no role for ivermectin in the prophylaxis protection against or the treatment of COVID-19. Betty wants to know, uh, people with gluten, dairy, egg, other allergies, do they need to worry about the vaccine? Hawk, I don't think so. No, no. in this case, no. there's no egg, there's yeah. no gluten, there's no, you know, things, stuff like that. Polyethylene glycol is not a gluten, so. Right. No, there, there'd be no concerns over those things. Um, even with the influenza vaccines, even with egg allergy, you can take the influenza vaccines, um, the regular ones, or even the egg free ones. So, um, you but, just have but, to be prepared. You have to have some things yeah. ready for you and, and, and with that. And right. so, yeah. And Amanda wants to know, can cancer patients get the vaccine if they are a few weeks out from chemo or radiation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the thing here is, number one, it will be safe. Uh, Again, we're talking about Pfizer and Moderna because they have the EUAs, um, the emergency use authorizations. The concern I would have if you uh, had recent chemotherapy is that your immune cells were knocked down due to the chemotherapy that you wouldn't mount a response. So you really need to have conversations with your uh, providing physician to discuss about your immune function. So it will be safe, but the question is, will you mount an immune response? Will you have uh, immunogenicity and reactivity to that uh, vaccine based on the recent chemotherapy that you've had? Gene heard last night that treating um, with convalescent plasma encourages mutation. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I would say that's false. I'm not really sure about that. Um, Convalescent plasma, number one, uh, the majority of the data now would suggest that it really is of no benefit. 
We don't use it here at the health system. We do uh, are using it in a trial base, though. We have Dr. Ella Truni, who's leading the Pass It On trial, which is a collaboration with Vanderbilt University. But that is very specific plasma. That is very high titer or high concentration antibodies. But um, there is really no indication that convalescent plasma um, induces the mutation or puts further pressure uh, on the mutation per se. And again, really it shouldn't uh, be used in, in treatment at this point anyways. Donna asks, how important is it for people to go back to the same place where they got the first dose for the second dose? So I think it is actually really important to yeah, go back yeah. if you can, because that way they, that place can help account for that. You can go to another <laughs> location. Let's say if you got a dose one place and you get, but then you have to go find out somebody to give you just one dose. It's really much easier to go back to the same place you got the first dose. They'll have the accounting for it. The state will have accounted for it to give to that location in order to give you the second dose. So you really need to stay with it if you can. There are some rare cases where you can't. It may, but it, it's just you're going to have to work hard to get, and scramble to get it arranged to go to a different site. Anne Marie asks, will there, will there be any issues uh, with people who are anemic getting the vaccine? I can't think of any issues. Can you? Help? I don't believe that there will be any issues. Yeah. No, no. No issue. Okay. Gosh, you guys are going quick today. Mm. How about that? We are I'm never like, those bad. Good I usually questions. have five minutes in between. The, okay. Boom, boom, boom. They're, they're good so, questions, but um, they've been pretty easy answers. Ah, this is good. I like but it. Important. But, but important. Yeah, they are important. Yeah. Especially that last logistical one. Yeah. I like getting to them. That's nice. Okay, so Christy says, is someone with IgA deficiency at increased risk for a uh, bad reaction from the vaccine? You know, the good thing about these questions is Hawkeye's here to answer them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm not an immunologist. We you're need Dr. Gear here. Um, you know, I, I don't see if you had IgA deficiency um, really a mechanism that would cause uh, an increased risk of anaphylactic reaction. I haven't read any of that in the stories about the um, the anaphyl anaphylactic reactions, um, and I just don't, I don't see a mechanism for that happening. IgA, for, for those of you in the audience, is one type of antibody that you make. Um, the main type of antibody that you've heard about in, in convalescent plasma, we're talking about IgG type antibodies. The other common type is IgM antibodies, which are made very early in the infection process and then wane and decrease over time. The IgA is just one other type, but I don't see a mechanism for IgA deficiency causing uh, you to be at increased risk for anaphylactic reaction. Kelsey wants to know about transplanted organs, patients with transplanted mm -hmm. organs. She says her sister has been told that she cannot get the vaccine because she had a lung transplant. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting. Usually that's true yeah. of live vaccines. That varies mm -hmm. a lot from one transplant program to another. We work uh, closely with Barnes for Lung Transplants and um, and, I, and I'll verify this, but I believe they are giving the they are are, are giving the um, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. So let, I'll, I'll verify that today and get back with you. Um, but I I thought we were doing that. Have you heard anything from any of the other transplant organ transplant programs? No, you know, in fact, when we do um, liver transplant evaluations in the hospital in in the clinic prior to the patients um, getting on the list to go to transplant, we really want them to get all their vaccines at that point because their immune system is probably stronger than it will be, especially after the transplant itself. And it, that may have to do, again, with what we talked about. If you're on immunosuppressive drugs, getting the vaccine may not take or may not take 100% to give you that protection. And I'm, I'm texting my friend who's the medical director of the mm -hmm. Barnes Lung Transplant Program right now. I'm going to find out. We'll see what he says. He's usually pretty good about answering. Okay, so here's kind of a double question. Lori says, um, she's asking, when will healthy seniors get vaccinated, like between 60 and 70? And then Carol's saying, who is deciding when the general public gets the vaccine? Yeah, the, 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 first, the, the answer to the question about who is first, what? What, 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 what will the date be or how many, when will the date be um, that we have enough vaccine to do that? So really what happens is the CDC issues general guidelines to the states. And then the states pass them down to local communities about what they expect. And then the local de health departments can have the guidelines as well. So there are multiple different governing bodies that help establish the answer to that question. The first thing is you got to have enough vaccine. That's we just don't have enough vaccine. I mean, they will, will just remember that. <coughs> Again, we, we quoted this number earlier. I think Kansas got like 23, 24,000 doses of, va of the Pfizer vaccine, right? That's how many we've got. Yeah. I mean, it's 20, I think I saw. Yeah. 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 And, and, and yet 
KU alone has 13,500 health care workers. Now, then you got to think about Stormont and Via Christi and Olathe and Advent Shawnee Mission and, and Hayes and Salina and Great Bend and Garden City. And, and, and so pretty soon you can say, oh, there's a lot more. We, we don't have anywhere near enough vaccine. So then you have to think about essential workers and, and first responders. Then you got to think about all the folks in nursing homes because they're at the highest risk, right? If you think about the folks out in the nursing homes who are coming, that's really where a lot of the deaths are coming from. So got to get all those folks. In. Once you get through that, it's been established that after that, we'll start giving it. And the CDC gave guidance on Sunday that we wanted, they wanted to say, okay, folks over 74, in this case, who would not be in nursing homes, who we think will already reach, reach nursing homes, will be the next line of people who get the vaccine. And I expect there will be further guidance as we move through that. But right now, the great variable in this equation mm -hmm. is time. And we don't know how to solve for that answer yet because, and I'm just trying to do a little cool math there, <coughs> we don't know how to solve for that answer yet because um, we don't know how, many va how much vaccine we're going to have and what the timeline is. Not only that, we don't know what's going to happen with the AstraZeneca a, is it going to be approved? B, what is, what is its level of effectiveness? C, what is the right group of people to give it to? We don't know about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. We know the Sanofi vaccine didn't look very good in those who are older. So ah, that one that one's hit a few bumps. So I, I, I think there will be plenty of vaccine in six months, and this question will become a lot, will become moot. But everybody's anxious about it right now, which is great. I'm glad you're anxious because that means you want the vaccine. The thing I'm, one of the things I'm scared about the most is that people don't want the vaccine or they're afraid of the vaccine or they don't think the vaccine's gonna work, that the vaccine's gonna kill people. Those are all not the right answer. The right answer is you want the vaccine. So I'm glad you're asking this question. I wish we would have a more clairvoyant answer for you. We just don't. And, the, the, and we will work, and as soon as we can help you figure that out, answers, or we can help our teams figure out that answer, we can start telling you when we're vaccinating our patients, we will get that information to you because I feel obligated to do that. But at this point, we really can't. Now, I, 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 again, the process is CDC issues general guidelines. It goes to the states. The states get really specific. They give it to the counties or to, uh, to health care uh, agencies. And then the counties say, this is how we want to distribute the vaccine within our county. So that's how this thing is going to work out. Yeah, it's all supply and demand right now. The demand is extremely high. The supply is low. Hopefully, with more companies coming online, we'll be able to get those supplies. But you know what there is a good supply of? Influenza vaccine. So this would be a good warm-up. If you haven't gotten your influenza vaccine yet, please go get it. You still have time to get it and build up immunity. Just in case, uh, you know, the influenza activity does increase in, in your area, in your region. So please go out and get influenza vaccine right now. There's plenty of supply. You can get it. It's readily accessible. Are patients asking you about getting the vaccine? Mm -hmm. What do they? What do you? What do they ask? What are they saying? Kind of the same questions. Yeah. I mean, basically mm -hmm. just uh, asking roll out. When can we potentially get it? When can my grandmother get it, et cetera? And of course, they ask questions in regards to safety profile and all those kind of things. So, yeah. and I, it, my typical response is going to be more personalized to that situation. Um, but uh, yeah, but they're asking. I mean, so you know, it's a good response. I mean, it sounds like a lot of people want the vaccine. A lot of people want to get back out, get to normalcy, which is good. Let's do. Royals are coming up, man. I so want to be at a yeah. coffin stadium yeah. this summer. We just have to work on those nays. The individuals who are kind of questioning the vaccine. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. We no. do have to work on those people. But you know, here's what I think. <laughs> I think as people see those getting the vaccine, and that they're safer and they can do stuff and they're not getting sick, I think they're going to say, "I want that drug." Yeah. yeah. So, Dr. Brown, Rita. Um, missed your explanation of what it was like getting the shot. Could you just remind us what that was like and if there were any side effects that you had? No side effects. And uh, Rita, if you've ever had a vaccine before, it was no different. Um, the process is pretty standard, just like any other vaccine. Um, it's a checklist, um, basically assessing or addressing if you have certain allergies to certain things. Are you having certain symptoms? If the answer is no, no you no, get can, a can nice shot. You're, you're looking away from it, though. You didn't watch it give it to you. Oh, there I go. Yeah, that's how simple it was. <laughs> <laughs> and now he's showing us his biceps. Yeah. Really, come on. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Do you guys so work it, out it, together? It, it, you it, 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 it was just that simple. Yeah, thumbs up. It was, it was simple. So, I mean, no, it was, it was simple. No issues, no side effects. So, get the vaccine. All right. I want to thank everybody. This has been such a great thing. So. Dr. Brown, Chris Brown, thank you for coming on the program yes, today. Thanks for getting your vaccine. Thanks for letting us uh, show that in public. And by the way, I love your Chiefs cup, mate. That's pretty cool. That's a good job. Mm -hmm. You got a coffee you. mug over here. It's got all about the Chiefs on it. It is, it is. All right, final thoughts from you for today? Get the vaccine. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> um, you know, 
I think the number of uh, infections is down around the city. I think that's a good thing. Um, it is certainly better than what we expected. The number of hospitalizations and down, that, that is better than we expected. I think people are trying to do the right thing. We need to stay vigilant uh, because there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Continue to do those things, mass, don't meet in large groups. I know we're getting to the, uh, the holiday weekend. It's going to be a longer weekend for a lot of people. So please just continue to be smart, be vigilant, um, do the right thing. And uh, there is um, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. We will get there, but it takes everybody uh, doing the right things. This disease is as much about viral variants as it is behavior. So please make sure that your behavior is the right thing to do. All right. Hey, tomorrow we uh, get some expert advice on how to use the holidays to reset for 2021. Yes, we mm -hmm. can do that. Our guest is Joan Wells, the CEO and co-founder of Wellington. She recently teamed up with the Greater Kansas City Chamber of Commerce on tips for reconnecting over the holidays and distancing, especially around estranged families and fr uh, friends and families. Plus, as promised, Santa's going to stop by. Is lots to tell us about how COVID-19 has impacted his work this year. You know, the holidays are a, uh, are a special time for all of us, and uh, COVID-19 is going to change it. You know, my wife and I were talking last night. It just feels so darn different, right? You know, it, it, first of all, it feels like Christmas came right on the heels of Thanksgiving so fast. And, and, um, and for all of us what, of, of different faiths, this is a special time of the year. And I, and I think that um, what we have to focus on, instead of all the things we've lost, is the things we have to come. If we can look more down the road as opposed to back over our shoulder, what we can see are some pretty impressive things. We see vaccination, which is gonna help get us back to normal. We see the rapid development of some of these oral antiviral drugs that we think are really impact COVID-19, kind of like Tamiflu does. We see monoclonal antibodies. We see society beginning to pull back together again. We can do that together. And yeah, the holidays, they are going to be different. But we should focus on being grateful that we're alive, that we're here, and that we have the opportunity to continue to improve our lives and continue to improve how we affect and treat each other. Let's take this opportunity to remember how, how do we interact and treat every member of our community because that's something when we return to more normalcy, we should carry with us. <laughs> Having a great support system and a good coach is essential in life, and this pandemic is no exception. As we say goodbye, KU coach Bill Self has the final words. A thank you to folks like Chris and a pep talk. And th that. You gotta come back all the time here. You do such a great job on uh, keeping up the fight. Remember as we said a few days ago, vaccines are here. You still got to play defense. Don't let down your guard. But now we have, we have Patrick Mahomes, a quarterback, when it comes to these vaccines. We can all win together. Game on. Let's listen to what Coach Self has to say. Hey, Jayhawk fans. This is Coach Bill Self, and I hope this message finds you and your family safe and healthy. These obviously are turbulent times in our society worldwide, but also in our own backyard. COVID-19 has affected many of us directly already and will positively affect us all in some ways, directly and indirectly, as we move forward fighting this dreadful disease. As we all deal with our changing society, we should not lose sight of all the people that have basically sacrificed themselves and their families to be on the front lines for the betterment of all of us. Those selfless acts by all the medical personnel uh, involved, all essential workers that allow us to still have day-to-day -day life as we somewhat know it, and certainly enforcement, the National Guard, there are so many that need to be thanked and be shown appreciation for the sacrifices you have made for so many you don't even know. Every coach out there that deals with individuals uh, has to have rules, and we tell our teams all the time, if it's good for us, it's good for you. And certainly that's something that all good teams respect and have to live by. Of course, it's a lot easier dealing with 15 individuals on a basketball team as it is maybe with 330 million Americans. But this is a time where the CDC is our coach. And they've instructed us 
the ways that we can best prevent this from spreading. They've given us some strict outlines on things that we should try to do. The rules are good for everybody. That means they're good for you. Be a great teammate. Follow them. Rock Chalk Jam.